Hello, you are listening to Talking Utter Slot, the slot car podcast. Be it Skeletric or Carrera, Slotter or SCX, we love buying, racing and most of all, talking about slot cars. My name is Scott Brownlee and I'm joined as usual by my fellow slot addict and car racer, Pedro. Now you do, you want me to say more? We had this uh, the last time as well, should we do it a third time? Because I've just talked over you. <laughs> okay. okay. Right. Do you want me to write something for you to say? Which is my name. It'll be fine. <laughs> I can remember that much. <clears throat> Not always. <gasps> Outrageous. Hello. You're listening to Talking Out a Slot, the slot car podcast. Be it Skeletric or Carrera, Slotter or SCX, we love buying, racing, and most of all, talking about slot cars. My name is Scott Brownlee, and I'm joined as usual by... Pedro. In this episode, we'll be hearing about what Pedro has been watching on TV and YouTube. Don't worry, it's not X-rated. Wondering how many organs we'd need to sell in order to buy the upcoming advanced slot Mercedes race transporter and Grand Prix car. And speculating what, if anything we'd make if we had a 3D printer. We start with a correction, an admission. We got our pony cars mixed up. Over to Pedro for the details. I was going to say, when you say we, what you mean is Pedro. Pedro got it all. Uh, There's a phrase for that one. I'm not sure. Are we a family-friendly podcast? I think we are, so I won't say arse about face. Um, No. Vanishing point, it's a Dodge Charger. It's not. What did I say it was? A Hemi Cuda? Don't even know if that's right. Post. Uh, whatever. I can't remember. Yeah, it's a white. I'm pretty sure it's white. I should have checked that as well. Um, and Dirty Mary, Crazy Larry, which I think I may even have got the film wrong. I might have said Crazy Mary, Dirty Larry. Whatever. That also isn't a Cuda. That that's there's multiple muscle cars in that. Well, two. Uh, they kick off with an Impala. They move to a Charger, and then they go full stop into a um, freight train. <clears throat> Spoiler alert. So apologies to the American listener. He knows his name and he knows where he is in the United States of America uh, for getting what... Those are like uh, nation-defining films, aren't they? Certainly Vanishing Point. That's the one with the line. I know you only wanted this to be a tiny bit of corrections (laughs) and now I'm off and running. Um, That's the one where Axl Rose gets his um, quote from the end of that song i can't remember it's where he goes um the the nazis are after the last uh, free soul on this beautiful free soul on this planet they're gonna get him they're closer they're closer do you know it are you a big guns and roses fan you're looking at me very strangely Scott. <laughs> anyhow that's the corrections done <laughs> moving on <clears throat> Okay, uh, I have no idea what you were going on about at the end there. Um, no, I, I can't does. stick it on as a soundbite, can I? Because then we'll get done for copyright. Probably, yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. No. You could sing it. You could give us a rendition. Yeah, but we'd get done nope. for copyright because okay. they'd say that must be Axl Rose singing. That that has to be. Such right. dulcet tones okay. could only be the one Mr. Rose. We'll take your word for it. Anyhow, slot cars. Move on. Yeah. Slot cars. What has caught your eye this week? Back to me again. Back Shouldn't to you it again. It's all, it should well, be more of a should ex- to me to you to me to you chuckle brothers kind of thing. Okay, well, what caught my eye, which I thought uh, I sent over as a note for you because I, I know you're into your resin weird stuff, and I can't I can't begin to pronounce it. The Renner Brutling truck from Mercedes, designed by that Rudy Umlaut bloke, Avant slot, <laughs> and both bits are going to be so they're doing the Blue Wonder for people who are tiring of this rambling. They're doing the Mercedes-Benz Blue, Re- uh, Blue Wanda Transporter, which was designed and built to carry a 196, I think. Yep, yep. Yep, it's a 196 so, Mercedes uh-huh. race car. And Avon Slot are going to do it, and I believe both bits are going to be slotified, so you can run your Renner-Lung truck, uh, and you can run your W196. So that's super cool, but going to be super expensive. I think we should just clarify that, given that this is sort of radio and paint paint. So these are ni- 1950s real vehicles, so the race transporter, to translate it from the German, which was a very cab-forward sort of pickup truck, flatbed uh, lorry, if you like, 
onto which the, the Mercedes Grand Prix team would load one Grand Prix car and then drive it to the circuits. But I think from memory, and I'm testing here, I think it had a Grand Prix engine itself, as in the same engine as the car it was carrying. Or something no, was really that similar. done for spares? <laughs> Just in case they and needed could do, that well, it. Well, it could do, I think, 100, but again, I'm, this is from memory, it could do something ridiculous, 100 miles an hour or something. It was very fast. Now, whether, whether it was scary as hell, because the driver was sitting right at the front and i think the front wheels were behind him and you know anyway it was it was designed to be very fast but it looks wonderful it looks like a proper um flash gordon set dressing thing it's all curvy and and, and i wouldn't say steampunk but it's sort of that and i have fortunately i have a die cast a 140 die cast of it uh, so i can probably resist uh buying a slot car version um but it will be very tempting because it's a very lovely thing and I think, it, but it'll be the talking limited production, so it's you know it's going to be so what, how much, well. They, they did that. Well, the tra uh, trains, the trains, uh, and that was two hundred quid, wasn't it? Was 200 it 250? So I'm going to see. Well, I'm going to see. Given that it's the transporter plus the car, I'm going to see uh, three hundred yeah. quid. I think two nine nine ninety nine under three hundred quid uh, would be my pitch. If we're okay. right, does one of us get one? I, I thought that had anyway. you written all over it. I thought you'd go for one of those because you you constantly reference Hobby Classic and people like that. In the past, when I was gainfully employed and had more money than I knew what to do with, I would have done. But n not now, I don't think. If, you, if mm. I tell you I've got one, it means I've won the lottery. Oh, and that means the end of the podcast and the last we see of you. <laughs> No, 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 no. Just my be daily then. My new house in a lit <laughs> Yeah, I, we could go travelling. We could take talking at a slot on the road. Oh, I see. You mean like a Radio One Roadshow? I see a Channel Four series. I what do they call the Radio Join One Roadshow? Oh, the Radio One Roadshow. <clears throat> that's a that's it's a call. That's called a callback to the listener in America who doesn't understand. Uh, what I'm talking about there, um, because I think I referenced that in episode mm, three. We probably ought to stop numbering them because it's going to start to get difficult, isn't it? The um, anyway, so yes, the advanced slot. I think it's great. Advanced. I think it's great. Anybody makes these sort of things actually, uh, and it's an interesting. Uh, I think one of the words I should stop saying. It says something about the current slot car market. You know, here we are in a recession. A global recession, there's a war on, nobody can afford to turn the heating on, all that good stuff. And yet we seem to be getting more expensive slot cars than ever before. So people like Le Mans Miniatures, Avant Slot making these things, uh, the Velasor gorgeousnesses, the Bugattis, um, you know, the general kind of prices of stuff. But this kind of high-end, limited production, very detailed thing, just simply, well... Did it exist twenty years ago? If it did, it was very rare. And you, I no, I, I would nice, say the market, so. the the market has matured. I'd be proven wrong, obviously, but I would say the market has matured, possibly even fractured a little bit. And you've got these specialist peeps. Um, did you say the what's the name of the the people who did the Bugatti thing? Vel Vel Velar? No, it's Velas Velasor. 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 You've got them. You've got this Avant slot. Um, they've done a couple of expensive ones recently. It's um. I think the market has matured and there are, there are people. It's like, rather like a lot of Formula One advertising and stuff. They get a lot of Rolex adverts as well, don't they? Because it's there are people with money. There's fewer. No, are there fewer? I don't know. There, there's, there's plenty of people with money. Okay. Rolexes and models of the Rin Rin Dringlin truck. I think that truck... It's an extraordinary piece of engineering, really, isn't it? Didn't they use a lot of parts from the kind of production line? So, uh, like you say, the engine is just a standard issue. Or, or I'm not sure it's a standard issue race car engine. but um, And I thought a lot of the components, like maybe the windscreen and stuff, they're just standard, ripped off the production line, stuck on a truck that looks mad. It looks very Jetsons. And I just had a little look at a picture while uh, you were talking, and um, the, the whole cab is forward of the front wheels. That is mm. a truly cab-forward design. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, well, there's a little, it's a kind of proto-Jerry Anderson. It is, isn't it? It looks about it, isn't it? Yeah. Very Captain Scarlet, something about it. 
or, or Jetsons Thunder, even. Anyhow, what, else, what caught your eye, Scott? Has anything caught your eye? I, well, I have to be honest to say not much because I was on holiday. Oh, and yeah, you were I off in Ireland. Do much, uh, I didn't do much slot car. I didn't find any slot car shops in Ireland. I wasn't looking, to be fair. Uh, I didn't <laughs> find any. Uh, and I uh, <laughs> found a lot of pubs, but that's an entirely different story. Uh, the um, I think the... Uh, not really much has caught my eye in terms of news, to be honest. So I'm, I'm that, that's why this is really the Pedro show. This one is going to be <laughs> back, back to you. What I, what I, I did jump in with get, the uh, the three D thing that caught my eye and set me ranting. Then, well, in a in a moment. But what I was going to say, just briefly, oh. was going to say was the uh, I as regular listeners may know, I took the plunge and have come close to the dark side and I've bought a hand controller with knobs more specifically uh, a true speed one which uh, I got some advice from the owner he I told him what sort of things I do and he gave me some advice and I bought one and it arrived while I was away on holiday so I've literally opened the box held it in my hand and gone that feels nice uh, but I haven't wired it up and I certainly haven't driven a car with it yet so uh, I look forward to the ongoing saga of me wiring up a controller. Now, you might think, are you being silly, Scott? You're a mechanical engineer by qualification. You're a mature adult. You run a house. Surely you can wire up a Skeletrix hand controller to make it work. Worth but honestly, I'm, I, am, I am a little daunted. Uh, electricity stuff has always been a little bit of a mystery to me. I was a mechanical engineer. Things you could see. You know, I like things you could see. And um, electricity, you can't until it sets fire to you. So the, uh, the, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit daunted. Uh, but I will, I will, I will sally forth. And, and my intention, uh, and this is maybe where I'm overreaching my abilities, is to be able to run it both at clubs when I occasionally visit clubs, so it needs a three-pin plug on it, but also to use it mostly at home on my polycar stroke Carrera stroke Skeletrix track. So uh, I'm going to be either have to keep rewinding it or for different connectors, or I have to find a way of some kind of adapter, universal connectory thing, which is where my aforementioned lack of electrical competence could see the whole thing come a cropper. And I get you with the lack of electrical competence. I'm not so scared of electrocuting myself with a uh, toy car controller, more that I will just fuse the house or fuse and burn out the controller itself. But it's a worry that I think you can get over quite easily by just, you know, doing it. But I'm, I need to take you back there because you said something about your track and it, I don't understand. I thought you had a polycar track, but you said polycar slash Carrera slash Skeletrix. You haven't got a track that men melds all those together have you no but uh although of course that is now possible thanks to the good people at um, Skelotto. well partly Skelotto, but also hobby uh, you mentioned them earlier who do you want to say hobby hobby classic? classic um because they are 3d printing track pieces uh hairpins but also kind of adapter pieces that widen out so you can join different kinds of track to different kinds of track Ah, uh, we referenced that before, didn't we? I think. Yeah. Are they doing a tighter Carrera curve? Uh, that as well. I mean, I think this mm. is where I mean, I'm going to segue into your three D. But this is where three D printing would seem to be really uh, interesting and useful. I go back to the original <laughs> question. I have a I have a lot of original Skeletric track, so Plexi track. I have quite a lot of Sport track. Um, and when I say original Skeletric, I include the SCX version thereof of that. Uh, I have Carrera track. Uh, and I have the Polycar track. Um, I tend to use Polycar on its own. I use the Carrera on its own, usually in the garden. Uh, and the Skeletric track, I can mix and match. So I can have Sport track mixed with the the Classic track, which is really good if you're doing a rally stage because you can get different sort of track pieces, different surfaces. And I think that's one of the great joys, uh, for me anyway, as an older slot car fan. And... Uh, you know, someone who poured over those old catalogues full of wonderful track pieces like pit lanes and paddock starts and Goodwood chicanes and all that sort of thing is all of these interesting shapes, possibly not very good for racing, but always interesting from a layout and play value. They all exist in the old Skeletrix. They don't exist in any of the new formats. Uh, so it's nice to be able to use them every now and again. We did discuss, uh, there was text messages went backwards and forwards in the week, weren't there, about... Um... 
your early days of school extra uh, included a pit lane and my my uncle Robert had a pit lane and um, I eventually uh, was gifted it and the pit lane piece I think was a quite a deluxe piece of track but it it seems like it was quite common that quite a few people had them it just took up so much space didn't it I would guess that the first uh, beyond just getting extra streets and corners that the first kind of uh, accessory piece people would get would have been that pit lane uh, because you can add it to a, a layout relatively easily then you get into the exotic stuff like the paddock start the Le Mans start um, the Goodwood chicane, etc. So, the uh, paddock start, they, the Le Mans starts, they never appealed to me. I never saw the point in... Uh, it seemed like a waste of a piece of track. In the, you'd use it at the beginning, and that was it. It would not... The uh, the skid chicane, I also inherited from Uncle Robert, and it was a well-worn skid chicane, so it was proper skiddy. Uh, and that was my favourite piece for a long time, I would say. It was fun. Well, I I was I was given relatively late in, late in life the 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 flying leap, the one with the sort of molded yeah. boulders, yeah. as if you're leaping over a ravine. I've never used it because I think it's just a guaranteed way of breaking, yeah, uh, guide pillars uh, off the cars. But um, so yeah, I think I think all of this stuff and all of the grandstands and buildings and people. Those early catalogues and the the lovely range shots, particularly the ones when they painted it, when it wasn't a photograph and it was a exaggerated perspective, very dramatically coloured painting that you would get uh, on the on the, the sort of flyer inside the box. That spoke of all the things that you could buy, and it was marketing and it worked. So the young me went, ah, oh, I want all these things. Well, do you uh, remember the old the... me could buy them? The the Christmas adverts that I have in my head from the I, they must have been the seventies, where they had a a couple of minis I think just running around this scenic track and then they launched themselves at the end I think it was, off the uh, flying leap, and that just made you want or made me want scale electrics for Christmas like nobody's business action man pff, move over I don't want any uh, Grenadier Guard outfits or scuba outfits for my action man I want the flying leap I think it would have been Highly disappointing if I had had it, but um, it certainly I got track off the back of it. But I need to take you back, Scott. Are we are we prepared to talk? And I, I'm going to quote you here: interesting and useful 3D printed products. Now we are. We are. I'm we sitting are. down, and the, okay. and the listeners have had a chance to kind of you know draw breath. And so uh, in our show, should, notes. should we issue? Should should we should we as is the fashion these should we issue a trigger warning in case any listeners are upset about what you're about to see about three? Yeah, and there's counselling available, and I'll be availing myself of it. <laughs> 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 is what the other is what the American listener will be saying because I have a suspicion. Mm -hmm. I have a suspicion the American listener has got a printer. I think he has got a printer. Anywho, um, what caught my eye this week, and what caused me to introduce into our show notes document a heading. 3D printing, question mark, WTF, question mark. <laughs> and then a link to what I can only describe as a 3D motor slave roller plate. There. Say it's, that again, because I think it's, it's such a complex uh, concept. Melange of words just... and concepts. And, yeah. and uh, a 3D <laughs> motor slave roller plate. Now, you can buy the and... basic... 3D motor. Break that, break that. Plate. Break that down for us. Break that down for us. What are we? What, what is one of those things? Well, so it's, a, a little, a... it's a little tray of 3D printed pff, acetate resin, whatever the hell it is. A little tray of it with some holes, such that you can put not one, but two motors, and an axle between the two motors, and then you can put pinions on your motors. Uh, a gear on your axle, and then you can run them. And it's like, why? I I I know people possibly in America, possibly elsewhere, will be getting agitated at my ignorance, but I find it blissful, and I do uh, I do wonder what the hell's this thing for? I don't get it. Well, when I looked at the picture, what it seemed to be is that one motor is as you see, connected to a larger gear wheel, which is on an axle, which runs parallel to the to the shaft of the motor, if you like. 
and then so well, not 90 degrees like, as it would on a on a car uh, and then there's another motor which is also connected to the same gear wheel so you're running one motor which is going to turn the gear wheel which is going to drive the pinion of the second motor i imagine Therefore, but this but, 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 using... but the second motor will be working in reverse won't it possibly i mean you're the mechanical engineer here one's going to be going around the right way and driving the other the wrong way isn't no it? no they both both motors will be turning in the same direction well there you go there's, the... there's the ignorance coming through they will both be going but in the same direction we both go in the same direction, uh, but I assume you would only power one because if you powered, yeah. well, unless you wanted double the power coming out, maybe that's <laughs> it. Maybe it's a twin motor and you, the, sh the power coming out of that central shaft is like some sort of Victorian steam engineering thing. But is the point to run in the motors or the gears, or the point is you're running in both, but the gear can only ever live with one of the motors if you're getting your mesh perfect and all that kind of jibbity jab. I, I mean, you. I don't know. I don't know. I think it's. I don't think this is a three D printing issue. I think it's a we Why? don't run in motors issue. <laughs> uh, oh, I do run because, in, uh, in water. Do you? Yeah, I three D print my so, water, so, and then I um, so, <laughs> and then I immerse my. In what, you run your motors in in water. Why do you do that? <laughs> because, um, uh, because it. I believe. God, my ignorance is rising to the fore here, isn't it? I'm not sure we should publish this one. Um, let people think I'm a genius, not correct them. Um, I've got so, I've got some bad news for you. They've had another <laughs> twelve episodes to establish that you. Anyway, I run my so motors in, take... in water because I uh -huh. understand that it means there will be less sparking uh, at the brushes and the commutator, and therefore less pitting of the uh, commutator. And therefore, you get a smoother, flatter surface uh, for the brush to run on. Therefore, you get better contact. Therefore, you get better oomph. Therefore, you get a little bit, if you're lucky, you get a little bit more revolutions uh, out of your motor. Certainly, I have tested before and after. Run my motor before and got, I don't know, 19,000 RPM. Run my motor after and got 20,000 RPM, say. Um, it's that sort of scale of difference. So I do it. I believe I shortened the life of my motors and I went through a whole spate. I'm not sure whether it was my um, perverse practices with my motors. Um, another accent for you there. Um, I, I strongly <laughs> suspect there was very good a, Dutch, I think. Yeah. It was pretty good. Uh, that wasn't Dutch. That was, um, that was Spanish. So did it. Um, I believe, I'm going to put it out there, and I we don't have a solicitor. So, Maurizio, if you do listen two questions one why and three please don't sue but i think slot it had a duff batch a while back uh and i had most of them because i burnt out several mabuchi can <laughs> slot it motors um and the only the, the commonality was one i'd put them in water to run them in two they were slot it motors so but let me just since then my slot it stuff. motors have been fine and i have continued to put them under water okay so um this is the very definition of paranoia, isn't it? So you think a, a manufacturer has a batch of dodgy motors, conspiracy theory one, mm -hmm. conspiracy theory two, you got most of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and that the you running them underwater in no way, shape or form influenced this performance. I, I don't know a lot about the intricacies of electric motors, and I'm sure all the pretty colours and the names and aren't, aren't slot car motors fantastic names like Ripper and Scorcher and I don't know what else they're called. No, anyway, they don't need to do that. Um, That's just silliness. It's, just a, anyway, it's all marketing. Um, and as you know, <sighs> there, my there's mantra, something and it will... Predator, isn't there? Which I think is a very like dodgy I mean, name. It's the Predator. It's very slightly. Yeah. It's a Predator. I think don't, the uh, don't take it down near the as primary you, school then. <clears throat> as you as you know, my and people can do whatever they like with their toy cars. I mean, running them underwater, and I am at least partly responsible for the the famous water splash at Slot Rally GB. And to this day, I put pictures of that up car running through deep water, and they go, "How do you do that? Why don't you get electrocuted?" And you go, it's distilled water. Water does not conduct electricity. Um, so therefore, uh, which leads me to my question, so do you use distilled water? Do you just pour it out the tap? Is it very expensive no, I believe it has mineral to, uh, water? I, I don't know. Um, 
Champagne. Champagne. Still the, Run your motors in on champagne. Let's start a rumour now on this podcast that champagne <laughs> is the oh, best thing for running in do, slot car motors. So I've said I'm going to do the um, Polycar uh, F1 thing again. If we now start putting out that the secret to a super fast motor is to run it in, in champagne, champagne. Other, all my other competitors will do that, obviously. I won't. Uh-huh. Theirs will blow. I will win. Strategy. But what if it's true? But what if it's true? Uh, then, what if I've stumbled? Then, then as is the, inevitably the secret to... going to happen, I will lose badly, which is what I expect to do. Um, I would like but to make you... it very clear. I don't. You said I run my cars underwater. I don't run my cars underwater. I just put the magnets, uh, the magnets, the motors the magnets. underwater, <laughs> and I use deionized water. I don't know. Um, I don't know quite why, but I, I think if you Google it, it says use deionized water. So I do. Well, that's kind of, yeah, it's got the bits because it's the bits in water that conduct the electricity. When we did slot Rally GB and the thing ran for the whole day, and um, sorry, I'm hearing a voice and it's the Alexa is talking to me, <laughs> which is surprising because <laughs> it's not connected. Because it's not connected to anything. Anyway, um, when we did run the Slot Rally GB and the water splash, and it ran the whole day, um, at the end of the day, when it had you know a couple of hundred slot cars running through it a few several times, there was little bits of dust and dirt and rubber and all that stuff. So it actually had some bits in it, and if you put your fingers in the water, it did give you a bit of a kick. Um, so it was uh, really it did it did pro- it did prove the theory. Yeah, but it says. Uh, but it was great. But yeah, champagne. Look, if you lose, at least you'll have a lot of slightly flat champagne to drown your sorrows in. But the problem is, I don't like champagne. He said, yawning. Sorry. Um, don't I like really don't champ- like champagne. Wow. I know people believe I have a champagne <laughs> lifestyle, <laughs> but I wow. don't like the stuff. It's got to be baby sham for me. Anyway, as I was about to say, you, uh, anybody anybody looking to me particularly for tuning tips has to remember that my mantra, soon to be available on uh, the hoodie and coffee cup merchandise from the Talking Utter <laughs> merch. Slot Shop. Don't call it merchandise, it's merch. merch. Merch is the, you know, if you want to go faster, turn up the voltage. Anyway... Moving swiftly on from your three D print, did we? Did we? Well, uh, one of the things we said was, "What would we make if you had a three D printer? What would you print?" So, and it's got to be slot related before you get too carried away. Well, it, uh, you broke up a bit for me there. It's got to be what before I get paranoid? So, slot car related, so you can't uh, print money or or something. <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, I did say, <laughs> or, or me, I else. don't three D print my water. Perhaps I should three D print my water. I so you mentioned this. I honestly don't. Other than I flippantly said a bottle opener, um, for no real reason. It's the first thing that came to my mind. Um, back on champagne and booze again. Um, this morning I looked at slotforum.com. Other forums are available, but that's the best one. Um, and someone has three D printed a chassis for a Scalotto, and uh, and put it up there and said, "Oh, it's your friend Johnny, Johnny." Shout out to Johnny down in Worthing. Uh, I believe he listens. <laughs> I pr- hope he listens. Um, he's 3D printed a chassis for you, some school or anyway. other. He used to up until this point. Uh, and somebody said, but why have you done that? And then somebody else said, but your printer, you need to turn your printer 90 degrees or something because it's printing. It's going to make for a weak chassis, this person says. Um, oh, it was that It was that Gary Skip, I think his name is at LMP. Shout out to at Gary Skip. Um, You have to turn your printer in a certain way, otherwise it prints all wrong and it'll be weak. So if I'm going to 3D print a bottle opener, I've got to get that angled right. And and Gary Wound say it's best at sort of like 45 degrees. I think, bloody hell, this is a complicated scientific process, isn't it? Which rules me out completely. What would you 3D print? Uh, Well, before I go, I was going to say, I guess these things have got a grain if that's the case, isn't it? So if you're having to take into account the way, the angle at which the printer is layering up, uh, it makes sense they've got a, that's got some sort of grain, so they may be stronger in some directions than others or more flexible in some directions. It's not a, it's not like a cast piece of material. No offence to Johnny, but um, I looked at his, I zoomed in on his 3D chassis and I, and, because I am slightly curious about the whole process, and I looked at it, and it was as grainy as feck. And I just thought, 
Wow. But I mean, if you see the underpinnings, that's not a problem. But if you're going to try and make a body out of it, then you're going to be sanding away for a long time, my friend. But we still haven't heard what you're going to 3D print, yeah. have we? Or did I talk over you? You'd never do that. I think I the I think the I answer is I, I don't know because it's not it's not something I would. Um, I don't think I'd ever. I'm not. So can I just say going? If only I had a whatever. Maybe. I mean, I think and people are already doing this. I think things for the I track, can't. so like spectators and you know that sort of limited run people interesting people for spectators or vendors or that sort of thing around the track mechanics that's that's quite but, a bit people are already doing that so uh, well yeah the slot car scenics is it they regularly rock up i'm sure they'll be at gaiden uh, in a couple of months time and they will scan you and then print you for 30 odd quid which seems a lot of money but then for the technology I, they got to get their money back it seems clever and it seems funny um do you think that perhaps we should get three D printed a, ourselves? A Scott, a Scott, Scott and Pedro. Pedro limited edition. <laughs> yours would be, yours would cost thirty euros. Mine's would probably be forty five because there's more material involved. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, can see come that on. you can. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And you're just fishing for a compliment, so. <laughs> I'm not. Um, I can remain silent on that score. Anyway, we how we. How did so? How that, did no, what I wanted to put, what I wanted to say was having come up with the idea of, hey Pedro, why don't we do a bit on the podcast about things that we would three D print? You actually have come to the table with nothing, nothing. Whereas I had a bottle yeah, opener at yeah, least. Yeah. Or are you gutted well, that I the do. Motor Slave three D breaking machine was done before you could actually bring it to the market? No, I know, and I and I I should add because I'm sure I'm going to bump into people who run their motors in underwater and prop their cars up and run things for hours and swap and do all that tuning and wonderful stuff and it's great and if you know if that's what you want to do and that's where you get your joy from then do it. I, what I think really doesn't matter. It's just not what I what I get from playing with these cars. I mean, very early on, I think one of the reasons that got us into this wasn't it to see that. There's no fixed way. If you just like buying these cars and keeping them in their box and looking at them, that's great. If you like buying old ones and restoring them, that's great. If you like crashing them into each other, that's great. There's no right or wrong way to enjoy. You know, we joke about the Church of Slot, don't we? There are many, as many chapters, and uh, well, I think I mean, people get too hit up about a right and a wrong way to do it. So. Yes, but Scott, there um, is. Yeah, We've had I don't, this I don't really there is the right and the wrong way, and my way is the right way. Right way. That's your that's your t shirt for the merch. <laughs> <laughs> my way is the right. <laughs> my way is the right way. <laughs> but yeah, I, but the serious point is, I think that's this. It should be fun. I mean, I you get into the psychology. I think that there's a huge. And it's huge. Is it huge? I don't know. It's uh Growing adult men with responsibilities and possibly families who spend money and time playing with toy cars, it's already a quirky thing to be doing. Um, and therefore, I think we should just, you know, all accept everybody's doing it. Alternatively, sort of stand at the side and go, he ran his motor in in champagne, bloody idiot. And um, <laughs> anyway, I don't know, not a rant, just a kind of, just, <laughs> just a I, I remember once going to um, a Subutio swap meet. And uh, sort of standing there watching people playing Sabutio very earnestly, I sort of looked at my mate I was with and said, look at these people, how daft are they? And then just as I was about to see it, I thought, yeah, well, we all gather together in a cold barn and play with Skeletrix cars, so, you know, don't, don't mock anyone else. Oh, yeah, well, I think Sabutio players can be mocked. I think it's only right that oh, we careful, mock Sabutio players. They take it very seriously, and they collect whole squads, don't they? They collect all the, all the kits and everything. And I am actually dead jealous because I love some of those. Uh, when, they, when you get a really good gay um, stadium with the grandstands and everything, I think it, as a modelly thing, it looks brilliant. But then the hand of God comes down, and rather than marshal a car, it flicks a whole player at a ball. How realistic is that, people? Come on. Crash and burn. It's it's. It's pretty good, actually. It's pretty good. Um, in fact, one of the minor inspirations for all of this was a, uh, was a, a YouTube uh, channel, which I think is now gone behind a, a paywall, but it was um, called Table Football Monthly, which was a couple of chaps who enjoyed their studio, and they would do a monthly video podcast about it, and it was great, and uh, encouraged me to dig mine out. So at the beginning of the second lockdown, the one that sort of started at Christmas, 
Uh, we got the Zabuti out, and we had a World Cup. Thirty-two teams draws draw competition. I I thought it would keep us occupied for a couple of weeks. We didn't finish until Easter. <laughs> wow! I thought you were going to say I thought it'd keep us going for a couple of weeks. It lasted a day before we started shouting at one another. <laughs> No, no, we were having we were having games in school. It was it was good fun, you know, and we couldn't do anything else, so why not? And the technology exists now that surely I, I forget what it's called the 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 clever eye thing that decides whether it was a goal or not. But you could have a little you could have a little GoPro down in the um, hidden lens down in the stands, and you could have a watch the line to see whether the ball actually crosses. You could do everything. I do oh, like yeah. Sabutio. I, I wronged it earlier. The idea of it, anyway. I don't want it, but I love the idea of it. I think a bit like and talking of realism, it works on the basis. Go, go on. Well, I was going to say it had that that joy of had you could collect lots of them. There was the accessories like the TV tower and the police set and all. You know, there was lots of things to buy. So the inherent set a pitch, a ball, two teams. The game was dead simple to get, and you know that it wasn't going to get any more complicated. But you could add and enjoy collecting teams, painting the teams, doing all that stuff. It was it had I think there's a lot of similarities and similar sort of time. That was you know probably 50s, 60s when it was at its at its peak. Was it? Maybe it's it's, it's sort of it's, you, you talk. I didn't I mean, didn't apply my brain. Um, the idea that you could buy white kits. Uh, Subutio white kits basically and paint up your own team it's almost sort mm -hmm. of um, a precursor to Warhammer and all that orc malarkey and space marines and that kind of jib jab isn't it uh, yeah at the time I used to repaint my existing so I would watch whatever world cup or something I'd be suitably taken with I don't know Peru so I would transform West Germany into Peru and then you know a few years later they would get transformed into somebody else um only when I became rich and foolish did I start buying. I'm in the market for hand-painted teams, again, a bit like resin slot cars. There's a market for these extremely well-painted and detailed uh, teams. Uh, really? Lovely stuff. I admire this. And, uh, yeah, when the... you say there is, there is still, it's still a thing? Yeah, yeah, you can commission guys to... I've, I've bought them as presents for... Uh, I absolutely you can, love the idea favorite team again. that there might be a podcast out there where grown men talk about some kind of stupid thing like toy footballers. I mean, how? Uh, oh wait, we should beat on. them. We should. What, we what should we talk we should... about? <laughs> you were talking about realism. We should I get together. That, I sent you that link to. I've, I'm going to forget the name of them, but they're. They're Americans, but I don't believe they're the American listening to the podcast. Um, and they do their own, they do films of their races and they do a commentary over the top. And as the one I sent to you, I watched it again this morning. I accused the guy of vaping heavily into one of the corners to just put a cloud of <laughs> fog there. But I don't think it was vape. Um, looking at the video, but they they start their race and um, the commentator says, and they're off into the early morning fog there, <laughs> and it's it's quite amusing. I'll try and find the link and put it somewhere. I don't know uh, if it ever gets to YouTube. This uh, podcast of ours, but um, I thought that was quite sweet, and the realism is quite amusing. If, if I, it is realism, again, I mean, it's uh, more like a scene from that film, The Fog. Yeah, it's it's that wonderful thing. It's piece of plastic with an electric motor running on a track with a groove in it you know there's not much that's realistic about it but uh, yeah. it does give us a lot of pleasure and a lot of fun and when you see some people's tracks lovely routed track that maybe they just for racing or they've done lots of landscaping and scenery and you know ah, but there's, a, there's fun, a godfather with your mates and great there's a godfather of the routed track um over in the states isn't it? i've forgotten his name but he had a website and he inspired a whole raft of people to do some pretty fantastic routed wood um, tracks. I'm going to, oh, I can't remember his name. I want to say Luff, but I don't think that's his name. Um, it's interesting though, isn't it? You're it's it's grown slips. men. They get to a certain age and all they want to do is take their toys to another level. Toys of their youth to another level. I think that tells us well, a lot about you male. You touch. We're coming to an end, a one for the future. We regular listeners will remember that very early on we had a letter. Uh, it wasn't a letter; it was an email. But anyway, we had a letter, uh, and it was from someone who works at one of the slot car companies who are going to protect. Oh yes, it uh, was. We've, we've to be completely protected. forgotten about him. Huh? And uh, no, no communication. And uh, most recent communication was an interesting point 
that, and I'm I'm summarising for brevity, we, whether us in general or the kind of blokes our age, talk about old cars quite a lot. We like old stuff, perhaps more than others. And what would the slot car business have been? So when we started in the 60s or 70s, if the only cars that had been available were 30, 40, 50 years old, would we have been interested in it? And do we need the new stuff to be interested in to, to get the newer and possibly younger people in? So although we all get very, you know, we've, we got very enthusiastic about a probably expensive uh, race transporter with a, a 50s Grand Prix car on the back of it. Here we are. That, that's going to be an 80-year-old car. So a model of something which is, you know, 80 years old. No, 80 years old. Something like that. 70 years old, at least, by the time it comes out. Um, would we have get just as excited if there was a modern version of that? And why not? Is there, uh, you've lost me. People? If there was a I, modern... I've probably lost the list as well, so we should... Well, the point... The gist was, um, it's all very well to get excited about old stuff and want models of old stuff. You remember we did our, what would we make if we were a, a slot car company? And everything we picked, I think, well, most of what we picked was old. There were vintage retro cars. But um, why didn't we pick the very cutting edge of the latest things? And I guess that perhaps reflects our age and our passions. But the question he put was, oh, I'm with you. Yeah, would yeah. we, would 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 we as youngsters have got interested in the hobby, had all that been available at the time was old models rather than current models? And it's a very well, good I think that's, that's a definite answer of no. But I thought, in my defence, I thought I was saying I wanted to do Super GT. I mean, I know I did want to do the 1995 um, Le Mans grid. Did I not also say I would like to do Super GT? Because Super GT, just they, they have some mad-looking machines. Great liveries, mad-looking machines. Um, and that's a great series. And I'm really annoyed. I don't know. It used to not be broadcast at all in the um, over here. I, I, maybe on Eurosport or something, I suppose. But um, I'd love to watch a bit of that. Everything's on YouTube after a week or two. I this mean, is yeah, true. I, I, this I is great. You know, so yeah, if you don't if you don't mind not watching it live live, then uh, you'll probably find it on YouTube. Yeah. Anyway, we're off. I do we're watch often, a bit of it. We're right. often, we've got we've got philosophical, uh, perhaps, but then that's our age. So I think that's what happens with us, Scott. We we begin with by bumbling around and not really being sure where we are or what we're doing. We talk a little bit about slot cars, and then we get all, all wispy and philosophical, and um, we fade out. And do, we, and do any listeners last this long? Right, Probably and not. tell us if you can. <laughs> we really should shape it better than this. Mm. Anyway, I'm going to say that's probably enough of the wistful meanderings of two middle-aged men with nothing better to do, otherwise known as talking out a slot, the slot car podcast. Pedro, you were going to say something. No, I was only going to say goodbye once you'd finished. <laughs> Did you once say goodbye? Stopped. Rattling. Not yet, not yet. I'll <laughs> say goodbye. Yeah, and I'll say goodbye. See you guys soon. Bye. Cheerio, Scott. You are listening to Talking at a Slot, the slot car podcast. Be it Carrera or Select Skeletrics. Skeletrics. I've got that wrong. Keep going. Carrera or Skeletrics, Slotter or SCX. We love buying, racing and most of all, talking about slot cars. My name is Scott Brownlee and I'm joined, as usual, by my fellow slot addict and car racer. He doesn't like to be called a collector. It's... Hello. Hello, everyone. Oh, you it... wanted me to say more. I apologise. Damn it. It's OK. We're on fire from the get-go. Rather like with episode 14, we're on the fire. We're on the fire. <laughs> we should be on... Oof. OK. <clears throat> Why don't I let you take over... The... This is episode 14. Is it? I thought it was 15. Here <laughs> we have. Uh, we genuinely... Uh, it's two old men who don't know where they are, don't know what they're doing, do. but are recording let's, for posterity and sharing with the world. <laughs> let's, let's, I, I know you like putting, but let's start again. This is this has gone way so far off piece. It's gone you just much. know that's right. going in the outtakes at the end. At the end, I don't, we're fine, but let's, <laughs> let's start again.
<coughs> okay. Ready? Yeah. 